no picture on the screen. The speaker gets his own sorry. picture among the pictures on the screen. No picture. No. Uh, I'm not sure if I can, but I'll 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 do my best. Yes, he's on the screen. Yeah. Let me just um, just bear he's with me for screen. a second. Uh, mute everybody. Mute yeah. all. Right there we are. So uh, Lou, you'll need to unmute yourself in a second. We can't hear you, Lou. You have to unzip, un, unmute yourself. Can you see this pointer? Yes. Yes. You can. Okay, good. All right, here goes. Um, the title of this talk is Space Time Algebra, and it contains, near the end, you'll see, joint work with Peter Rowlands about a nilpotent version of the Majorana Dirac equation. But I want to begin by uh, talking about background ideas that are part of what motivates my thought and should be uh, related to ample ideas. So. Lou, we've lost you. The sound's gone. There was something wrong with the way this is behaving. You can hear me now? Yes. No. Yes. Uh-huh. Then let's try the share screen again. Yeah. Yes. You can see the screen? Yes. Yes. And you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, and can you see this? Yeah, yes. and, and it's working. All right, fine. We're good. Um, well, let's start. So I'm making some background remarks about uh, what looks like all sorts of ruminations. About nothing. Um, the usual notion is that nothing refers to an undiscriminated background or a clearing. Uh, but it also means not a thing, not an object, not a sign, not a symbol. And in that sense, nothing can be everything. Everything not designated, everything not articulated, what comes before articulation. And so in that sense, the concept of nothing is identical to the concept of the implicate. What are the contents of the empty set? We're prepared to say that the contents of the empty set are void, nil, nothing. Any attributes here of form, containment, contents are just that, artifacts. There's nothing in that set. And the peculiar thing is that this comes from our training in mathematics and language in general, that while if I were to say to you void or the nothing, uh, it sounds vague, but when I form the empty set and say, there's the empty set, it feels concrete to us, even though we have to assent to the fact that the brackets around it are not anything in particular and could have been replaced by something else, and that there's nothing inside it for sure, although there might be some paper or bits producing the vision on the screen, but we understand that there's nothing in that empty set. And the nothing becomes quite palpable as long as it's put in the context of the brackets, which are imaginary as well. So by a double imaginary construction, we find ourselves happily talking about nothing. And in set theory, two sets are equal if and only if they have exactly the same members, as you know, but that says that any two empty sets are necessarily equal because they have exactly the same members, none. The form we take to exist arises from framing nothing. The empty set is a first existence, a first distinction. It's entirely imaginary. And what frame do you choose for nothing? 
because whenever you do have a nothing that seems stable for you, you chose some frame, like the brackets for the empty set inside of a plane space, but it might have been drawn on the surface of a Mobius band or on the surface of a sphere or on the surface of a torus or somewhere else. And there's always a context in back there stabilizing your imagination. Uh, one thing we like a lot are creation stories. Creation stories that start in the condensed place, in the implicate place, such as zero is equal to infinity, everything is equal to nothing. And then finding that one can articulate into something, into a realm quite definite and complete in, the, in its own way by doing some action. And um, I wanted to show you an example, which is so well known to those who know it. And simpler than the Conway example, which has been cited often. Um, it could be regarded as a part of the Conway example of creating all numbers, but I'm going to create a lot of numbers. I'm going to start with zero, which is zero over one, and one over zero, which is equal to infinity, and I'm going to say, all right, there's a gap. But there's nothing in between to begin. And now I'm going to fill the gaps always by the following rule about putting a fraction in between two fractions. If you have a fraction A over B and it's less than another fraction C over D, then you can add their numerators and add their denominators the way you wanted to add fractions, but were not allowed to do so. And it will be in between as you can easily verify. So if we started with zero over one and one over zero, then in between them comes one over one. And that's the first day. And on the second day are born one half and two. In between one over one and one over zero is born two. In between zero over one and one over one is born one half. And on the next day are born one third and two thirds and three halves and three in between the in-betweens. And on the next day, more, one fourth, two fifths, and so on. And each day gives birth to a exponentially increasing number of numbers, each one unique, uh, a unique reduced rational fraction. And if you go all the way to infinity, you obtain all the rational numbers between zero and infinity, each born once. A nice creation story. and. Uh, makes you wonder, why did that work so well? And there are a lot of them, and it's worth searching for them if you can find them. Um, this is another kind of creation story, which I'm drawing uh, graphically, which is well known to you, maybe not graphically. I start with two distinct entities, left and right, and I put them in a circle. And then I ask for all the ways that I can discriminate among them. I could discriminate L, put a circle around it. I could discriminate R, put a circle around it. Or I could discriminate L and R together. And that gives me three. And I don't talk about emptiness here. So that's two squared minus one, all the subsets of L and R except the empty one. Um, and now I do it again. So I could take on L, put a circle around it, take on R, put a circle around it, take on L and R, put a circle around it, or take L and R together and put a circle around them, or take L and R and LR and put a circle around them, or the other pairs, L and LR and R and LR. Seven, two cubed minus one. And if you were to do it again, which I won't, you'll have 127 entities. And if I do it again, I will get two to the 127 minus one entities, which is a large number, I've written it down. And then I will get two to the two to the 127 minus one minus one entities, which is really quite a large number and can't be written down. Not this way, but of course I wrote it down uh, right over there on the left. And this is the blowing up in the combinatorial hierarchy without the linear algebra that also proves the blowing up. Um, this is the combinatorial hierarchy and I recommend it to you uh, you've recommended it to yourself, but I recommend it to you anyway, um, at this level of its construction. 
there is the technicalities that people worry about, but this is the essence of it. And you might think about what happens in this hierarchy just at the level of its own structure of discriminations, which is, I think, what it was meant to be at the beginning. But those founders, they had the idea that this could be physics. And it's such a wonderful, absurd idea that some philosophers uh, make fun of it, uh, not even knowing that they're making fun of the combinatorial hierarchy. I once went to a lecture by Hilary Putnam, and he said, well, mathematicians, mathematicians take an object, and then for them, there's an awful lot of existence associated with that object. There's the lamp on my desk. There's the set consisting of the lamp on my desk. There's the set consisting of the lamp on my desk and the set consisting of the lamp on my desk. And there's the set consisting of that and so on and so on. And apparently the mathematicians would have you believe that there are an infinite number of objects all present located along with the lamp. And where are they exactly? And what do they mean? And uh, he went on philosophically about that. Uh, but the founders who brought you the combinatorial hierarchy are saying, well, maybe you ought to think about that. Maybe that's the physics in some way. Everything from nothing, nothing from everything, parts and holes, finding holes, finding frameworks, general principles, physical laws, what are the most mysterious generalizations? What are the most mysterious constructions? Implicate, explicate orders, and so on. I'm just collecting here. But my favorite, and my favorite kind of goes through and through everything else we're going to talk about today. My favorite is that language is equal to its own meta language. And it's everyone knows this, and we all use it. And in fact, we would not be able to communicate if it weren't for the fact that if we make comments in language, they're still in language. We never exit. We're always making our comments in the language. The language can always be extended to include comments about it, constructions made of it. The language is equal to the language commented upon. And this, of course, leads to paradox, as Russell points out, and many others. But, but it also is exactly the context that allows an observer and a communicator to be present. And it is the context which allows you to make the comments that are of the form well. We shall take this particular formality and we shall put it in a box. And we won't comment on it except outside the box. And then we can begin to do certain aspects of mathematics. But maybe we forget that language equals meta language and that you could live there. For example, suppose that I take A to the B to mean A is reflecting on B. A and B are actors. Then language is equal to language reflecting on itself, but maybe I make a formalism. A line over A line A meets the line B and out comes A reflecting on B, a formalism for it. And then language zips around and meets itself and comes out as language to the language and comes back and is equal to itself. And we can represent it by a little curling. And we can make other models. For example, we could have entities. And when you start to speak reflexively, then a lot of different conscious entities come up and can be described if you allow the reflexive thinking. You are thinking about this lecture. You are thinking about your breakfast. You are thinking about the person next to you and wondering whether he's thinking about the lecture. Uh, all those reflectivities. And we can write down some elementary ones, such as the king, the red king over there, is thinking about reflection, x to the x. He's thinking about reflection generally. And he becomes a certain kind of entity who's thinking about reflection. I guess that's when he's awake. Over there, he's asleep. But the king who thinks about reflection is a certain kind of entity, which we'll call g. And g is thinking about reflection when he thinks about anything. 
he thinks about potatoes and he thinks about potatoes reflecting on potatoes. He thinks about Alice, he thinks about Alice reflecting on Alice. But then if G, this entity, should think about himself, the reflecting entity, then he becomes the king thinking about the reflecting entity. And so G to the G it becomes Alice. Alice is equal to the king reflecting on Alice. Alice is equal to the king's stream. All these things are possible if you take little formal languages and allow them to comment on themselves. This is a well-known idea uh, hidden in the realms of logic and computer programming and called lambda calculus, but it's an idea that deserves to be made understandable to everyone. And one person who did put a lot of effort into, for, into popularizing these reflectivity ideas was Raymond Smullyan in the context of his puzzles. But we have g to the x is equal to k to the x to the x, g to the g is equal to k to the g to the g, a fixed point, a fixed point for reflection. There are other fixed points such as an infinite nest of boxes and then that nest of boxes is equal to itself with one more box around it. Such fixed points in general I call eigenforms and there's a famous paper by Heinz von Forster called Objects as Tokens for Eigenbehaviors and we've returned to objects. Objects arising well in the mathematical domain but not just in the mathematical domain that objects arising because they are fixed points, fixed points for your observation, observation stability. Um, when you look at something, it doesn't change very much, or if it did, you would begin to investigate that. You might find objects that are created by some special form, such as standing between mirrors, and then the whole hall of mirrors is created in this way. Objects can be understood as being tokens for eigenbehaviors, for behaviors, whose behaviors, yours, the world's, you have to investigate. But objects disappear in this epistemology into eigenbehaviors. There aren't any objects. There are only these behaviors, these relationships. And von Forster's famous quote, I, and the observed relation between myself and observing myself. So if you're thinking about creating from nothing, or if you're thinking about the nature of objects in the light of the fact that objects are disappearing in front of you as soon as you try to theorize, as soon as you try to understand what's going on, you don't have enough objects quite, uh, then these thoughts recommend themselves, at least to me. Um, here's language, which is language commented upon by itself. Wittgenstein said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Spencer Brown quotes, the value of a crossing made again is not the value of the crossing, that's up there. And nothing acting on nothing produces the first distinction down there, where I've made a symbol for nothing in the form of a zero. Um, and then we can think of this as the this Spencer Brown crossing uh, formula that the universe fitting into itself disappears its own distinction as the ultimate uh, nil potency. The simplest example of the of a universal nil potent equation is given by the operator u on x is x cross. Here the universe is that universe of distinction created by the mark and taken to nothing by crossing from the marked state to the unmarked state. And then there's creation from nothing in a continuous background. And, and now we run into what I call topo logicism. Uh, logicism was the notion that you would create all of mathematics and everything it can do from pure logic. And um, it is a somewhat tarnished subject. Uh, topo logicism is creating everything from continuous backgrounds or from nothing. And this is my favorite one. I start with a continuous line and I let it curl upon itself a bit and slide around 
and it creates a particle and an antiparticle, which I have called one and minus one down on the bottom through continuous motions. Localized particles that can move apart. There seems to be a lot of substance in this lack of substance here. Um, then there's topological physics, and I wanted to give an example. This is a clip from a film of a real experiment due to Professor Alex Yenko in Novosibirsk. He has a vortex running <clears throat> due to a turbine-like action, circular action, and, and you are watching the vortex line move a bit uh, as time goes on. And that vortex line moved upward in back of itself, as you see, and it's getting close to itself. And when a vortex line spinning around gets close to itself with the right orientation, it can interact with itself. It's just beginning to interact there. And I think we only see the beginning and the end. There it is. It can reconnect from this position to that position. That's, of course, a discontinuous motion. Nature in this topological movement undergoes a discontinuous motion, and the result of the discontinuous motion is a lasso. That loop down there in the bottom is ringing around the, vorte the, the, the vertical vortex. Topological physics. Um, that's a picture of what just happened. This went up. And then the reconnection happened uh, down here, right there, in between those two. And you ended up with this ring. Amazing. Um, this slide is, um, is an artist's conception of, um, of braiding particles in a two-dimensional physical space. These vortices down here are particles quasi-particles moving around in a two-dimensional space in the artist's conception. And <clears throat> this braid is indicating how he would perhaps like them to move or how they have moved around and causing the braid to get twisted up. Uh, more notions of topological physics. But now I'm transiting into a background for some topological physics, which uh, is going to lead us back to nil potency in a little bit. Um, and that is the work of uh, Majorana a long time ago, who had the idea that particles could conceivably be their own antiparticles. And he got to this idea by thinking about the theory of the Dirac equation. Um, when you usually run the Dirac equation, you get some solutions which are complex wave functions. And when you take the conjugate of such a thing, you get something that could correspond to an antiparticle. If the function were equal to its own conjugate, it could be a particle that was its own antiparticle. But then the equation, instead of being over the complex numbers, as quantum equations usually are, would have to be over the real numbers. So he went into a search for how to rewrite the Dirac equation so that it was real. And we're going to get there eventually, but I wanted to tell you a bit about recent fantasies or ideas about Majorana fermions, particles that would be their own antiparticles. And if you took it in the most literal sense, you might draw some, in, some Feynman diagrams like this. The particle interacts with itself to produce itself. That would be the simplest universe in which you had a Majorana fermion, right? It would just interact to produce itself, bing, or it would annihilate itself. That's all that happens in this particle's universe, the simplest possibility. Um, but let's build a little algebra here. The standard fermion, for a standard fermion, like an electron, there's an annihilation operator and there's a creation operator. I'm going to say this abstractly, and then we're going to see it a little more concretely. These correspond to the fact that the antiparticle is distinct from the particle. And you have that the square of f and the square of f star is 0. This is Pauli exclusion, essentially. And then you have a special relation which has its own motivations, that f, f star plus f star f, it depends on the order in which you do them, is equal to 1. That's the algebra 
that describes a fermion, the usual one. We'll see more about it. But in the Majorana situation, you need somebody whose star is equal to itself. And it turns out, and if you were to read recent literature, deus ex machina, people write down uh, a little Clifford algebra like this, a squared is equal to one, b squared is equal to one, and ab plus ba equals zero, ab equals minus ba, the simplest Clifford algebra um, of two elements. Um, and they say, ah, these will be the Majorana fermions. Why do they say that? That looks a little mysterious. It's not at all like the ordinary algebra. Where did that come from? It didn't actually seem to come from Majorana's original work, uh, which we'll talk about later. It seemed to come from a very simple consideration about, oh, I used a U. The U is the creation and annihilation operators for fermion, our friends from the other slide. But suppose that I were to write them as combinations of these Clifford elements. Bear with me, you'll see what I'm going to do. Um, so I'm, I'm defining U is A plus IB over two and U star is A minus IB over two. It looks like exercises in complex numbers from solving quadratic equations, except that A and B don't commute. And so um, if you were to take u squared, I'll multiply by four to get rid of the twos, then I have a plus ib times a plus ib squaring, right? And that's a squared minus b squared because i squared is minus one plus i times ab plus ba. Uh -huh, we're doing non-commutative algebra and a squared and b squared are the same. So this is zero zero here because they're the same and here because they anti-commute. So u squared will be zero. And by the same calculation, u star squared is equal to zero. We're creating fermion operators out of the cloth of the Clifford algebra. And if you take u, u star plus u star u, well, that's going to be u plus u star squared, isn't it? Because u, u squared, when you square it, you get u squared and you get u star squared, and then you get this thing. So what is u plus u star squared? Well, go back up and look at u plus u star. And you just get a, right? The ib goes away and you just get a. And so it's a squared, which is one. And there's the fermion equation. Hmm? Um, uh, this is, of course, you can track the appearances of nilpotents as we go along. First nilpotent. Um, there's a, there was a... Um, kind of game that's been going on here, maybe it goes on in other places, uh, which is bear spotting. Uh, when you walk around in Hyde Park here, uh, you look for stuffed bears in people's windows. Um, I don't know, perhaps you get points for finding them. Uh, so, uh, so the point is uh, that uh, people who are trying to think about uh, the way electrons behave, recently, maybe since 2000, started uh, thinking, well, fermions could be written in terms of Clifford underpinning, and why not work with that, right? Um, and uh, since that, those things could be thought of as particles that are equal to their own antiparticles, because A star equals A, this would be Majorana fermions underlying fermions. An electron could be thought of as two Majorana fermions, and its anti-electron would be two Majorana fermions. And the way they, the electrons interact would be a consequence of the way the Majorana fermions interact through their algebra. Well, it's puzzling. And I'm now digressing. Um, I did that preface because I wanted you to understand why I'm digressing in these ways, because I can't help myself keep thinking about the general context that I'm working with. So the next part is devoted to Spencer Brown's logical particle, the mark. And, and you notice, if you look at Spencer Brown's logical particle, that it might as well be thought of as a Majorana fermion in the way we were talking about it. That is, it interacts with itself to produce itself, or it interacts with itself to do away with itself. It has those two possibilities. Um, 
So it's a logical particle, and it could be thought of as a Majorana fermion. Um, I won't comment on that slide, but I should comment on this slide because this goes back to the epistemology. The mark is not just the mark in the plane, it's a mark you made. And as such, it's your creation, and you arise along with the mark, and the mark and the observer are not only interchangeable, but in the form identical. Consciousness or personage or that action goes in and out and keeps coming back whenever we understand that there's somebody there. Iconics. Um, if you let it be, a, if you let the interaction of the particle be happening in space time like this, then two circles could interact to become one circle by going through a saddle point, or they could interact to become nothing by going through a saddle point in a minimum, or they could interact to become nothing by coming close to one another to the point where they fit perfectly and dissolved. The iconics are very interesting because they actually do lead to other things, such as the braiding of these particles, the stringy nature of them, um, diagrammatics for them, or other ways of projecting them out and interrelating them with other mathematics, which I'm not talking about here. Um, at this point, I'm going to just skip these slides, which are pointing out how the circles work well. And I can't resist, though, um, going back to Wittgenstein's Tractatus and looking at the things he said. He says, the negation sign corresponds to nothing in reality. For him, the negation sign is part of the web or mirror of language that can reflect reality. And that he's talking about the world of descriptions and the world of propositions. And he asks, how can the all embracing logic which mirrors the world use such special catches and manipulations? only because all these are connected into an infinitely fine network to the great mirror. Of course, as you know, later Wittgenstein removes the mirror. And even at the end of the Tractatus, he would remove the mirror by saying, whereof we cannot speak, we must remain silent. But perhaps we don't. And the subject does not belong to the world, but it is the limit of the world. I'm standing in a place of epistemology where most of these are negated and the negation sign is certainly part of the world in the form of the distinction. Okay, and then there is the fact that we have eigenform as I've discussed before, and that's a process, the process of eigenbehavior, which could be space, entirely spatial, or it could be displayed in time. And we can see how the fermion algebra emerges from the eigenform. And I wanna show you that, and then we may skip a few things in order to get to the end. But this is really quite interesting. Um, I think of the eigenform's first production as an oscillation, uh, as a temporal oscillation like that. If you display it not in space but in time, then it oscillates in the sense of being odd, even, odd, even, odd, even, like that. That's its basic oscillation. You can think of it as building up spatially, but it's oscillating between odd and even. And, and then that oscillation can be examined in more than one way. You can think of it as an oscillation from zero to one or as an oscillation from one to zero. I'm examining the structure of a temporal distinction. And if you look at it that way, then you can combine waveforms or oscillations term by term, like I wrote up there, A and C combined together and B and D combined together so that zero and one combine, zero one combines with itself to produce zero one, P squared is P, Q squared is Q. P and Q multiplied by each other is zero. The zero and the one could be taken as just elemental. We haven't really reached arithmetic yet. 
Um, and Q squared is Q and P plus Q is one, one, one. Mm -hmm. And now I make temporal operators, operators U and U dagger. Temporal in the following way, that the temporal operation eta shifted across an iterate, shifts it to its complementary one. An oscillation from zero to one shifts to an oscillation from one to zero. Time has advanced by one step to the right. This is cyclic time of order two, but time nonetheless. So eta flanking a zero one is a one zero. And eta shifted across a zero one is eta on the left and a one zero on the right. So now look at what happens if you took u to be p eta, the temporally sensitive zero one look, and u dagger to be q eta, the temporally sensitive one zero look. And you multiply a u squared, and you get p eta p eta, but that's p q, and it's zero. And u dagger squared is q eta q eta, which is q p, which is zero. And u plus u dagger, what do you get from u plus u dagger? You get p plus q times eta. Ah, so that says that u plus u dagger uh, squared is going to be u squared plus u dagger squared plus u u dagger plus u dagger u, and it will be one, eta squared is one. So the fermion algebra arises directly from the re-entering mark, from the structure of a distinction understood temporally. And the nilpotents have come back again. Um, you get to the square root of minus one by shifting your arithmetic to allow minus one. I will skip it um, and skip the formalisms of doing the square root of minus one this way, except for one thing. And that is when we do that, and it's the same as before, but with one and minus one, we have one to minus one oscillation. And the square of that is one. And we have the shift, which is really a comment on the language, but it's been reinserted into the language, language and meta-language reinsertion occurring here like that. And E eta is minus eta E. So we have E squared and eta squared are one, and E eta is minus eta E. That's it. There's the Clifford algebra, and we can take it and run with it, but it's also called the split quaternions. It produces its own square root of minus one. That is, if we take E eta and square it, then the temporal shift on eta flips it to minus one, one. And when it interacts with one, mi one minus one, you get minus one. I squared equals minus one because of the temporal shift between one I and the other from this point of view. And it means that the product of the two elements in the elementary Clifford algebra has square minus one, not square plus one. But we haven't quite gotten to the quaternions. In order to get to the quaternions, you need another square root of minus one. Very interesting. And um, I think Peter could maybe make a remark about charge in relation to the extra square root of minus one that might illuminate this. I'm avoiding it here. Um, I'm staying with the Clifford algebra and allowing my square roots of minus one to appear uh, parsimoniously only when I multiply Clifford algebra elements. Very strange that you have to add in a commuting square root of minus one, apparently, to get to the quaternions. Well, I do want to skip a couple of things. I want to skip kind of rapidly over the fact that people have gotten interested in this view of electrons as combinations of Majorana fermions. This is electrons as pairs of Majorana fermions in a paper by Kataev, which is quite um, a, a good source paper for a lot of things that came after. Because now a row in a nanowire of n electrons could be thought of as a row of 2n Majorana fermions in that sense. And Ivanov, back around 2000, thought about braiding the Majorana fermions. And he discovered people have claimed some detection of these by correlations. I won't go into it. But 
there is the idea of braiding the particles. Bro, the braids are the world lines of the particles moving in a plane space. So this is a plane space and particles are moving around in it, vortices moving around in it. But over time, you see a braid and that braid represents the world line of the particles, but we can analyze the braid topologically. And in particular, we could ask that the braids satisfy the rule uh, for braiding in topology that um, that a line going under and then over in this form could be shifted across, or you can think of this line as being shifted down. Um, the basic braiding identity in topology. We could wonder whether we could make our particles satisfy such braiding. And that's what Ivanov was studying, how to do that. And he found good formulas for making braiding representations that are of the form one plus the product of a Majorana times the next Majorana uh, and divided by the square root of two and found that they satisfy the braiding identities and give rise to a representation of the braid group, which means that you have unitary representations of the braid group related to the underlying structure of electrons. Um, I had best just clip this quickly because I want to get to the end. But the basic reason for the braiding is that what, what um, Ivanov put in here were those square roots of minus one. They were products of Majorana entities, pairs of them, they squared a minus one. And when you take one plus i over the square root of two and one plus another i over the square root of two, two different i's, an a and a b, and you just do the multiplication and check it out, you find out that sigma a, sigma b, sigma a, the thing you wanted to look at, is symmetric in a and b. So it means that it's equal to sigma b, sigma a, sigma b, and there's the braiding coming mysteriously out of the algebra of the square roots of minus one, out of the split quaternions. And in fact, you can construct the quaternions directly if you have three Majorana fermions. That's a wonderful point. Uh, you still don't quite have that free square root of minus one that you would like to have sometimes. But if you just had three Majoranas, three uh, Clifford algebra elements anti-commuting, then you can take BA for I, CB for J, and AC for K, and you'll find you have constructed the quaternions. And you have a braiding operation as well. You have these three braiding one another. And the braiding of the Majorana fermions in the end, after you represent them so that each each of these particles is one Majorana fermion, and you use Ivanov in a certain way that I haven't quite mentioned, then you find that when you braid two adjacent fermions, one of them gets a minus sign and the other doesn't. It comes systematically out of the way Ivanov's representation works. Whereas we're familiar with the belt trick, which would interchange two particles and create a minus sign that floats between them in the form of a 360 degree twist on the belt. The topology becomes specified and it's possible to think about structures of braiding underneath the electrons. And people hope that it will work to give us some better kinds of quantum computing, maybe a hundred years from now. But now I want to talk about the Dirac equation and I've given myself a little time limit here. You'll recall how it works. Um, in special relativity, E squared is P squared plus M squared. If the speed of light is equal to one, and I'll take Planck's constant equal to one in the bargain. And Dirac wanted the square root for E so he could write a Schrodinger type equation for the electron that would be relativistically invariant. And so you could choose alpha and beta forming a little Clifford algebra, alpha squared equals one, beta squared equals one, alpha beta plus beta alpha equals zero. And then if you took E to be equal to alpha P plus beta M, when you square it, it's the same arithmetic we were doing before, you get alpha squared on P squared, beta squared on M squared, and alpha beta plus beta alpha on the M. Um, and everything works out. You get P squared plus M squared for E squared. So if you then shift that over to the quantum operators, 
where the quantum operator for energy is I d by dt and the quantum operator for momentum is minus I d by dx. I'm doing one variable. Then you would write I energy equals E applied to psi. Um, and E applied to psi is then given in that operator form and you get O, my I d by dt plus I alpha d by dx minus beta m as the operator, which should give you zero if you were to solve Dirac's equation. And if you take a plane wave, now I'm telling Peter's story. If you take a plane wave and you apply that operator to it, down comes E minus alpha P minus beta M, a familiar thing. Um, and we could let delta be equal to that. And then if we multiply delta by beta alpha, unnotepotent, Beta alpha is that square root of minus one, created out of the Clifford algebra. Beta and alpha interchange when we multiply by them, and now you have the, the coefficient of the E squares to minus one, the coefficients of B of P and M square to one. So you get E minus E squared plus P squared plus M squared, and everybody anti-commutes, so the other terms go away, and there's the fundamental nil potent. That means that if we just shifted the Dirac operator by multiplying it by a beta alpha, then we would get a solution to the Dirac equation of the form u times the plane wave. Now, I have unfortunately repeated myself here, but just go to the bottom of the slide. The new operator uh, applied to the plane wave gives you u psi. And so if you apply it again, you'll get u squared and you get zero. So we have a direct solution to the Dirac equation in terms of the nilpotent u, and the nilpotent algebra itself contains lots of wisdom about the meaning of the fermion, which we are not going to go into, but that's what Peter was talking about yesterday in great detail. Um, and, the, and what about the fermion algebra? Well, the fermion algebra appears because the antiparticle could be taken as reversing time, which will reverse the coefficient on the nilpotent. And then you will have the nilpotent for the electron. Um, the first nilpotent is this one. Well, it's a, a two-dimensional electron. Um, and the nilpotent uh, for the uh, conjugate is one, one sign change. These guys square to zero. And uh, when you fi figure out u u star plus u star u, it'll come out 4e squared in this case or something. I didn't normalize it to 1, but it all gives you a fermion algebra. It's uh, the same story, but coming out directly from the nilpotents. There we are. There we are. But now, now the direct, now the, uh, I shouldn't rush. I'll just use 10 minutes and do this. Now I want to talk about the full one plus three dimensional situation for the Dirac equation. And I want to put it in a certain form that makes things nice. So we're going to reformulate in terms of what I'll call space-time algebra. And by a space-time algebra, I mean a Clifford algebra with generators one, two, three, four, so that the first three square to one and the last one squares to minus one. Uh, and they anti-commute. So the generators fit into the Minkowski metric. If you were to, I unfortunately use P for a point, uh, but it's not momentum. If I formed X E1 plus Y E2 plus E3 plus T4, then when you square that, you get X squared plus Y squared plus C squared minus T squared. So that should make you feel at home with this algebra, space-time algebra. Now, what about the Dirac algebra? The Dirac algebra, if you were doing it in full one plus three dimensions, demands an alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and a beta all squaring to one and anti-commuting. Um, and uh, if we were to just define the beta to be minus i e four, and alpha alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three to be alpha one to be the e one through e three, then there's a space-time algebra for you. Okay, just added an extra i, that nefarious commuting i. And then the standard Dirac equation, if you check it out, is i d by dt and then i alpha 1, i alpha 2, i alpha 3, 
and a minus beta m. That's the operator. And if I were to rewrite it in this language, it gets another i. And then I could wipe the i. I don't need it. And I have d by dt plus e1 d by dx plus e2 d by dy plus e3 d by dc plus e4m. And there is a Dirac operator for you. So you see, the general theory of the Dirac equation could be expressed in terms of Dirac operators written in space-time algebra. Now we come to Majorana. Majorana's problem was in this language, he didn't write it in this language, to find coefficients e1, e2, e3, and e4, which were space-time algebra, and were real. Well, I've given you an example, because we can take epsilon and eta to be the operators we had before. They're actually little two by two matrices, real matrices. Epsilon is the diagonal matrix with minus one and one on the diagonal. And eta is the simple permutation matrix, zero, one, one, zero. Real matrices, all right? And they satisfy epsilon squared equals one, eta squared equals one, epsilon eta equals minus eta epsilon. There are iterants. And, and epsilon eta squares to minus one. And then we take another copy, another copy, and those are denoted by eta hat, epsilon hat. And those copies commute with each other, but they're non-commutative in their worlds. And then we try to find a space-time algebra restricted to these real Clifford algebra elements. And here's the solution. This is actually pretty much the one that Majorana wrote down. You see that each of these squares to one, except that one, which squares to minus one. And they all anti-commute, as I'll leave you to check. So there's the space-time algebra, and there's the Majorana Dirac operator. Now, what about nil potency and what about other solutions? Well, first of all, nil potency corresponds to this. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't double check it for you except to show you something. But this is the general form for what will be nil potent. You need somebody whose square is minus one to be constructed. So that when you multiply across by it, then you will get mu d by dt and a new space time algebra over here. Then you will have a nil potent Dirac operator and every the whole story goes through as before. So we can have nil potent Dirac operators for Majorana. And um, here's the example, the one I wrote. If I multiply by epsilon eta, uh, I best not do it for you, but it's written out in a slide. If you multiply by epsilon eta, you will see that this guy turns around and becomes a space-time algebra all over again. And in fact, if you do the uh, intense little exercise of figuring out what kind of space-time algebras you can get, you can get this one and you can get a couple of other types. So there's this texture of little space-time algebras that are informing the Majorana um, equation. And now you're at the limits of the research that Peter and I are doing at the moment. We're in the process of writing a paper about this, and we haven't yet made, um, uh, we haven't yet understood fully what the import of the existence of this very definite collection of algebras on the Majorana equation means. But this is an exercise in that direction. You see, it's a real equation, but you can get some complex solutions. You put down a plane wave and use the nil potent method and write down a complex solution and you will get um, and you will get some um, you will get some nil potent uh, use as we did before. And um, and so we get uh, we'll, what we get is the Majorana operators for this coming out. We actually do get Majorana operators related to these Majorana fermions. And we can write down actual solutions to the real equation by taking the real and complex parts. And they look like combinations of cosines and sines with coefficients that are the Clifford algebra Majorana type operators that anti commute and have squares equal to some constant. So it turns out in the end 
that those Majorana operators that people have been calling Majorana operators are actually related to Majorana's original equation. And there's a lot of structure to look at in Majorana's original equation that we're in the process of working with. Um, so that's where we are. And I will thank you for your attention. Lou, thank you very much. That, that was a, a beautiful presentation. Um, I, well, I, I, you can, everybody can, um, if you want to speak, you can press the space bar. Um, and if you want to say something, um, either raise your hand in the interface or uh, just wave your hands around. Peter wants to say something. You've got to unmute first, Peter. Unmute. Hang on, let's, let's uh, sort that out. Yeah. I was just uh, moving something, that's why I was waving my hand. Okay. Um, but, uh, but I'm just saying we, we don't understand totally the physics meaning of it, and we're still working on that. We've got various ideas, and uh, they, we don't, don't want to say too much about them yet. Okay. Anybody else? Any questions for Lou? I'd like to uh, say something. It's Mike. Yes, Mike. Mike Manthe. Um, Lou's uh, stuff about my Majoranas is looking a lot like what I have. I've, I figured out that what I have been doing is I've completed, I've made a complete uh, combinatorial version of all this, uh, where three plus one is not taken as primitive, but rather uh, a hierarchy made out of Feynman diagrams, basically. <laughs> And so uh, I have the Majorana, I have all of these things, and I recognize a lot of these forms, especially the electron thing you had there, which is, uh, shows up as, uh, uh, I, mean, I get the same electron version as you do. So uh, I guess my question is, it seems to me that what I have should equal what you have, because you're just on the other side of the three plus one divide. Do you not agree with that? Oh, well, me, it, may, it, may, it may well, if we look carefully at what you have and what we have. Um, what you're noticing, certainly, is that what happens in this way of looking at fermions is that one is focusing on the algebra. The algebra meets the, the continuum in the sense of u times e to the i something, which is a continuum. So the continuum and the algebra are separated but can be recombined. And over on the algebra side, everything is combinatorial. And one is looking for different ways to combine the algebra to correspond to particle interactions. And I think you're thinking uh, in a similar way with concurrence as your guide to understand how the uh, interactions are working, right? Mike? Mike, my talk on the 24th will uh, go through all this in, in, uh, right. in explanatory detail. Right. I'm out. Okay. Any 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 other questions? Yeah, I had a question. Um, uh, yeah. Even though yeah. in the full space time algebra, there is um, not just the generators. There's also the higher graded elements, and I was interested. Um, could it be that this um, extra square root of minus one is the pseudo scalar element that the highest grade which is the the product of all of the uh, lower grade elements together mm, that's right okay uh granville uh, hi um, yeah uh, i see that uh, number two to the power of one two seven uh again and uh recall it in the um, Pierre Noyes best shift and suddenly we're faced with knowledge that in the in all the integers up to 2 to 127 the primes are now appear with perfect smoothness and so it's just to posit that um, um, 
Uh, sorry, your voice is breaking up a bit. If he has limited bandwidth, he should turn off his video while he's speaking. Yeah. It. Granville, try turning off, turn off your video. Yeah, the um, the the pro the pro we have knowledge now that the prime is nothing. So, write it down, Granville. Reliable source of. Write it down, Granville. presentation. Um, yeah. Okay. Granville, yes, just just write yeah, write the question. Uh, it might yeah. it might be good if he has a specific thing he's trying to say to put for him to write yeah, it. In might, the yes, I agree. Yeah. Granville, can you write your question down in the chat because uh, we can't hear you, unfortunately. I could ask one more question in the meantime. Yeah, sure. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Go. Okay. Um, this is a slightly challenging one, but you work, Lou, um, beginning from uh, the laws of form distinctions through the um, re entering uh, mark to create the iterant oscillation, um, and you build that all the way to the Majorana fermion and then to the Dirac equation. Um, would it be possible to make this completely constructive in the sense of creating a law of form circuit? So you have this square tooth, uh, sawtooth up down oscillation pattern and to uh, elaborate that into something that is emulating a Dirac equation. Sure, if you allow, if you allow that your circuits have self-observation of the widest possible kind. Uh, that's why I said um, uh, I am uh, as irrationally as possible living in language that comments on itself. And, and up there, everything is fine. The circuit is observed and everything works fine. And then the question you're facing is one that may be very, very hard, which is how can I make a cut uh, of the right kind uh, that, will, that will have over here some kind of um, uh, uh, a mechanism observable object which has all these nice behaviors like the kind of consciousness that's needed in order to make that circuit work. But you could always remember uh, that you're living in it. It has been observed that, that laws of form circuits are reflexively conscious in a way that they have observed themselves. So you, you already have that potentiality in there. Well, you know, every time you try to make a little formal model of, re of, of reflection, and then you want to make it in the usual way, which says, okay, it's over here. It's a formal system. I'm here. I want it to behave nicely. Uh, it's, it's a robot. It's a computer. It's a mechanism. Uh, then, you, uh, then you find out that it's incomplete. And to the extent that it's faithful to what you want, it will always be incomplete. That, that just is the way it is if you make that kind of a distinction between the observer and, and what's being built. But nevertheless, you can make it behave as well as you like uh, within some criterion that you have, I'm sure. Uh, it's a question of how inventive you're going to be or what you will discover. I mean, we're doing this over and over and over again. Uh, it's just helpful for one's sanity to remember that it's already built what you're trying to build, but you just don't know how to build it. And it might not even be possible to build it. Raises the philosophical problem that the original Feynman project of having a quantum computer to simulate quantum physics may not be possible. It may not be able to 
create that simulation in isolation. Uh, in right, right. So, so there, what, what problem did we run into there? Quantum computer, it isn't like building conscious computer, but it's building a computer that is so sensitive uh, that it can handle quantum processes, but is so protected that it will not get uh, decohered. And, and this problem is not solved yet, uh, but it will be solved to various degrees of, uh, of satisfaction by the people involved. It will. Um, Uh, Lou, can we go back to uh, Grenville's question, which he's written down? I, I oh, don't know if you can yeah. see it. Uh, he says, we now know that the primes appear with infinite smoothness and regularity to 2 to the 127 and beyond. So in a universe of size 2 to the 127 or 10 to the 38, we have some objects which we can now algebraically manipulate. Um, let me answer Graham's question first. Graham says, do I have a URL? I'll put the slideshow on a URL, but are, are we doing something systematic about our slideshow? Um, if that's a very good question. Um, my suggestion is that we post them on Ampa chat. Okay. Meaning the email or, yeah, or yeah, the, the, yeah, email, the email, send an email around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. But I'll also send any, but the only way to post it would be to give you um, uh, a link to it. And I'll do that. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, Vanessa says, can, what is uh, and the link, link to Ampa chat. Okay. We'll have to sort that one out as well. I, I, I assume that people are on Ampa chat, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But uh, um, there, there are indirect ways in which people find their way to Ampa. Um, now, as far as uh, uh, Granville's question, um, I, I don't know about what is special about all the primes up to 2 to the 127 or all the numbers up to one, 2 to the 127. Um, whenever we choose some particular way to express size, we run into a limitation. That's what you see in this um, bare bones version of the combinatorial hierarchy. Um, if I decided to express numbers by writing a vertical slash for one and two vertical slashes for two and so on, then I run into the limitations of size very rapidly. Uh, but I learned to abbreviate um, so I could write two to the three slashes or two to 100 slashes and get a huge number uh, by my abbreviation. And I can always write more abbreviations and work with larger and larger numbers. And eventually I run into the limitations of whatever language I have in order to express numbers beyond a certain size. And then I have to invent new language, but I always can invent new language. So, uh, so this goes on like that. It goes on like that. And I don't know how to, how to put my finger on what is special about two to the 127? But then that's the question about the combinatorial hierarchy. What is special about that place where it blows up? Um, the founders, I say the founders rather than saying all their names. The founders had the idea that we would look at uh, linear transformations, which represent matrices, which represented the distinction shifts up level, up level, up level. And then the matrices had a certain limitation that happened from the algebra itself. And so you got a crossover there and you could articulate what was the problem in an algebraic way. But I'm uh, advocating a freedom of expression with regard to combinatorial hierarchy in that if you just take what I said as the basic combinatorial hierarchy, then why not think about discrimination in that kind of framework freely rather than trying to follow some previous lines and see what you get. Mm -hmm. So, so then Granville's question is, Granville's question is very interesting in that it's asking, well, what is special about all the numbers that are happening below that level, all the, all <laughs> the entities that are happening below that level? Okay, Mark. Um, I wonder if I can ask a question, Lou. Um, 
if we are to take you take your starting point in saying that nothing is so important nothing is so important if we are to see nature right in the sense that our um, ecology of mind you know the, the batesonian stuff is is aligned properly and we think in the way that nature works what kind of experiments do we need to do what kind of science do we need to have if we are going to go searching for nothing or under studying nothing <laughs> well what are you studying well, that's okay yeah i mean you're in the you're always in the middle when you're studying right uh, except maybe that maybe in a certain sense some mathematicians who might be thinking oh well how can i create everything from the empty set right um mm -hmm. like, and then some people have invented very nice things by thinking about that so so frege and von neumann they said well you can start with the empty set and then you form a collection and you form another collection and you can build all the numbers right um so some stories really do create from nothing and as i said i think that creation stories they're very interesting to look for um they're they're not so hard to look for in mathematics because you were saying well it, this system doesn't have very many starting gates anyway and what's happening with the starting gates am i what am i assuming what's the basic thing but it's still the same <coughs> in in science because you're asking what are the basic distinctions that i'm using in order to bring forth this science mm. and then you may you may suddenly realize that there are some distinctions you're making that you probably shouldn't be making like mm. peter yesterday said well partons and quarks they aren't necessarily the same a lot of people are just identifying in their mind partons and quarks because that was such a good publicity for the situation before at that time but but Gelman was making that distinction very strongly when he first wrote his papers he talked about um uh his his quarks as as a mathematical structure and then there were concrete quarks that were not necessarily the quarks and he spoke disparagingly about uh Feynman's putons if you remember right he, he didn't want the partons to be the quarks but uh eventually people decided that they probably were the quarks mm -hmm. so what distinctions are you making is the point and and it's hard to understand what distinctions you're making when you get to fundamentals yeah yeah and and there there are so many levels it, because we we think about distinction making distinctions at an individual intellectual level but of course you've got to deal with a discourse you've got to deal with institutions you've got to deal with the scientific establishment and so on presumably uh, mm -hmm. dino that's a question oh yeah. yes uh, i would like to ask you uh, about uh, the just the beginning of your lecture uh, when you uh, the point uh, when you said uh, that uh, language equals meta language so uh, i'm uh, uh, well uh, i agree to, uh, i agree and uh, uh, probably <laughs> what i'm going to say tomorrow <laughs> is just uh, 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 a very vague uh, re reflection of what you said uh, properly today on language but uh, i wonder whether uh, mm, for instance in logical terms uh, uh, mm, take uh, the the solution that uh, uh, barwise and detrimentally gave to uh, the uh, liar paradox they say there is no paradox logicians uh, like paradoxes but uh, it's just uh, one sentence which can be assigned to different uh, propositional uh, uh, content mm -hmm. so uh, 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 one expression of language you can take it uh, as a, a, a linguist uh, as a belonging the same sentence belonging to the object language 
and belonging to the meta language. But they are different because, in my understanding, one is in a first order logic, whereas uh, in the meta language is second order logic. So uh, uh, there is another uh, dimension because uh, Spencer Brown. Uh, uh, calculus uh, said uh, it, 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 it in a way this uh, pre, uh, uh, we don't have to invoke uh, uh, type theory uh, if you use my calculus because the mark uh, as uh, you very well know can be uh, the mark itself uh, so uh, uh, an, uh, an operator but it can be also the operand so it can be uh, an operator and the value of an operator. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in my opinion, if you uh, uh, talk in, in, in these terms uh, in which, uh, uh, of course, there is an oscillation between the two states uh, and the, in a temporal way, but uh, there are the two states. I, I don't know if I, if I said something Clear, but uh, the, the, uh, in 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 other terms, uh, I I, uh, uh, I think that uh, one of the most unfortunate things in logic was uh, Tarski's distinction between language and meta language, which uh, gave rise uh, to <laughs> a, lo a logic without semantics, which is not maths, which is full of semantics. But uh, that's another another question. But. Uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, levels, and that's uh, the, uh, not in the sense of a, a, a combinatorial uh, hierarchy, but in the sense of uh, ta uh, uh, first order, second order, uh, and so on, predication can be... Uh, 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 otherwise, uh, you telescope everything on the same, on the same plane. And you reduce everything to the, the value of an operator. For instance, relevance logics, uh, they do the, this uh, trick, but uh, they have to uh, introduce something which uh, uh, operates in two senses, in an object language sense and in a metalinguistic sense. So I think that uh, language contains its own metalanguage. And it can be uh, the same uh, uh, expression uh, which can be used in, in, in one sense and in another. Well, probably, I don't know if it was clear my point. Okay, so first of all, it's ambiguous unless you interpret it correctly or interpret it in a way that's harmonious for you, what Spencer Brown means when he says there's no need for a theory of types. I can only tell you what I interpret that to mean. First of all, the calculus itself exhibits the fact that an operator and an operand can coexist and that something can operate on itself. And there is no need for a type theory there. However, and then his other point of view was, in ordinary mathematics, things can be written in terms of themselves. For example, x equals 1 plus 1 over x defines the golden ratio. And, um, and so the logical dictum that you shall not define things impredicatively uh, is uh, not quite true about ordinary practice. Um, um, so how do you become clear about this sort of thing? I say you become clear about this by understanding, first of all, that you already know that you can comment on anything that you say, that meta language and language are ident identical in practice. Then you also understand that if you do not make some further distinctions, you can run into things that you don't want. So you make them. Um, so, for example, uh, you decide, as Russell and Whitehead did, that you will never define a set uh, in terms of, um, of a, I mean, you will always define sets in terms of previously labeled sets, right? You, you adopt that one way or another. Mathematicians 
don't use a theory of types, but they do say generally, whenever you make a definition of a set, it should be in terms of things that have already been made, right? And you avoid paradox that way. You make some rules, you make a game, and you hope that your game is consistent. But you never really know if the system is rich enough, whether or not the system is consistent. The only way you will ever prove it to be consistent is by using a larger system. We, are, we know all these limitations. So we found out that we found out a lot about the game of making a distinction between language and meta language in order to keep things in order. And we understand that it's very important to be able to do so, uh, but that there are limitations to our knowledge of what goes on once we do it. So, um, so that's what I take to mean that there's no need for a theory of types. There is often a need for types. Uh, I see. Yes, yes. But uh, for instance, you mentioned lambda calculus. Lambda calculus <laughs> uses uh, types, uh, or, or doesn't it? So you, if you do lambda calculus freely, you write down the uh, Russell paradox immediately. That's fun. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but then how you handle paradoxes depends on what you want to do. There are a lot of different points of view about handling the paradox. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but my point is, for instance, uh, uh, in logic, uh, the uh, deduction, the so-called deduction theory theorem, uh, you have a, a sentence which you can take as an asserted premise and you can take it out as a rule, for instance, the distinction between an axiomatic treatment, uh, uh, demonstration, uh, 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 derivation, and uh, 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 natural deduction uh, derivation. There is a difference. It maintains well, natural deduction. Yeah, of course. Nat well, natural you, deduction. You, uh, you, you set up you set up games that are informative for your purposes. Yes. Right. For example, I could say from the point of view of epistemology that um, I'm studying self-reference and circularity by studying topology. But it's a harmless remark as long, uh, at least it's a harmless remark if I keep on playing the game of topology in the usual way, which is, oh, over here are all these circularities. And uh, I don't think of them as um, sets that are paradoxical. Uh, they just are these cycles. And I'm using cohomology or whatever to understand these cycles. And, uh, and everything is just fine. And then on the other hand, um, I will walk into someone who, whose epistemology is different. And then I begin to be a little disturbed by what he's doing, maybe. Maybe a, a Diego Rappaport. Who, who tells me that everything should be thought of in terms of the Klein bottle epistemology, well, then I have to think, well, do I accept this epistemology or what is he really saying? He's crossed the boundary between looking at topology in my, uh, my preferred objective way into the, into the personal uh, relationship to poly, uh, idea, and then, uh, then you have to sort it out. So, so mathematicians are generally quite careful about saying, well, we're, we're obeying these rules. We are keeping track. Uh, and uh, that's natural. We have to do it. So we have to make these distinctions between the language and the commentaries on the language. And then we can also, if we really understand what we did, let them go and freely talk about what happened across the boundaries. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, if, if we had a coffee break coming up, I'd be hurrying yeah. people up too. Uh, but there, there are four questions waiting. Um, yeah, there are. Let me, yeah, let so, me look here. So um, Wolfgang has got... Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I, okay. Uh, of course, as some of you know, I'm very interested in the physics of consciousness and uh, and quite frankly, whenever I see these wonderful, and I'm trying to learn all this good stuff, uh, in, in my view, the symbols you guys are writing down is, 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 is simply a reflection. If there is to be a model of reality, it is not in the symbols, but it is in the, uh, 
well, in, in the mathematician, I'll just call you mathematicians, okay. who is operating the symbols, that becomes the physical model is not just the stuff written down, it is their implementation by people, by physical that, yes, systems. Exa exactly. That's the question, yeah. E exactly. So, so, so just along those lines, I really would love to, this, this thing that Spencer Brown the first distinction, the mark and the observer are not only interchangeable, but in form identical. Uh, I'd, could, could, you make, could you expand that a little bit? I just don't see well, how. Yeah, sure. Um, so here is a mark on a piece of paper, right? Got it. Yeah. Um, but without an observer present, the mark certainly doesn't make a distinction. You had, to, uh, you had to act in order to see that it made a distinction between an inside and an outside. You had to project uh, the boundary. Perhaps that was the boundary that you actually projected, the dotted line I drew. The, the mark itself does not make a distinction. It is you in conjunction with that mark that make a distinction. And um, and, the mar and, and so if I refer to the mark, I'm actually referring to the arising of the mark and someone who made the mark or observes the mark or who is the mark. The mark and the observer are two sides to the same thing. So um, you could take it as a symbol of neutral monism, which says that consciousness and the world arise uh, out of the same mm, implicate. Well, so basically you're saying when someone is talking about a mark and then generalize it to almost any mathematical symbol or any logical symbol, that we're always, we're always actually talking about the combination of the, the thing that we see plus the system that's doing the seeing. So we're, we're talking well, about a yeah, larger... That's, that's right. I'm saying that, but of course, if if you were writing down a symbol that referred to an electron, then the story is much more complicated. You could take your symbols personally and how they interact. And it might be that in your working with the theory, the way the symbols, mm -hmm. uh, symbol system itself is working is very important. But it also is in your mind that there is this train of possible things that people do in the world that they call observing electrons. Uh, you teach physics uh, or have taught physics. I never did, but the idea of telling people about uh, uh, getting people to understand that when you talk about an electron, you're not talking about a thing. You're talking about all those actions that give rise to the fact that it has quantized charge and so on, all those experiments. It's all of that that you're referring to when you write down the word. Yeah, yes, of course, but that's often lost. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, you're not going to teach that. Uh, to, to uh, no, but you have you to teach, teach. But when you ask yourself, what, what, do I, what am I actually doing with the language? Then all that's present, although you can't hold it all. So, so you have a tendency to just look at it as symbol manipulations or, or not, right? But you can't, you can't hold the whole reference so easily. Right, right. Okay, uh, so it, the next... In some Sorry, ways that, oh, in, in some ways this reminds me of the conversation we just had about the uh, meta language because uh, uh, if I wanted to build a machine that implements theory, I would always have lots and lots and lots of symbols that only refer and only produce other symbols. But every <laughs> once in a yeah. while you have to have an I.O an input-output portion of your machine. And it's at that point where you have a symbol meaning something that is a, I'll just call it a physical sensation that I would call a thing. You know, like I've, I, there's a, the screen in front of me is a thing. But, you know, inside myself, in order to get to that point, there's lots and lots of internal calculations going on and at some point you have to hit the IO input output of a machine or so, of yourself you you need you you may be going on privately uh, in whatever way you do and then you say oh i have to tell this to dino how am i yeah, going to right. do that <laughs> right yeah i'm, I'm going to have to hurry hurry you up a bit I, uh, so we got um 
Vanessa and John, if you can both um, just uh, try and keep it brief, I think. And, and yeah, so Vanessa. Are you there, Vanessa? She was there a minute ago. Well, maybe John, you can go now. Um, okay. if, if well, I'll keep it brief. Uh, I'm trying to get back to Mark Johnson and his yeah. question, I, as I understood it. So Schrodinger in his book, 1944, What is Life? I think he made a very important statement about negative entropy being the animus, the uh, uh, force vital. And I think that's zero. That's the nil potent. So in our Zoom, uh, Mark's Zoom that I participate in, we talk about that a lot. So I thought, Lou, maybe you could address that because I think that's the nexus between what you're talking about and what I'll be talking about on next Tuesday. And that is that, and as I said yesterday, the ex explicate order only begins once life begins. And so there's that interface between the, uh, anim uh, the animate and the inanimate, which is the dialogue that you're talking about. Maybe you can comment. Yeah, that's a very beautiful remark. I, I look forward to hearing your talk and then I'll try to say more. We'll, we'll talk more. Okay. Okay. Uh, Vanessa has got a frozen fish stuck to her computer, I know, because it's overheating. So it may be the problem that she's having in trying to talk to the rest of us. She may, she may be looking oh, for another well, person. I'll make a comment on her comment. She said yeah. DNA started from nothing, but has now created all of biology and future life forms and so on. But, um, uh, but if we tell the story, uh, people try to tell the story of or ask the question, how did DNA start? That's such a good question, right? At the molecular level, how did that yeah. molecule come into being? Uh, um, Stuart Kaufman has his theory about that. Other people have their theories, right? Uh, so you can look at a nothing and ask, well, how did that have that particular? I mean, you can look at a something and ask, how did that particular something come into being? Uh, and 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 the stories you you create are very interesting and might be scientifically worthwhile. Like I say that my story about getting one plus minus one out of a continuous line is worthwhile, at least to me, as a way of thinking about the relationship between discreteness and continuity. Thank thank you, Lou. Doug, you you got a question? If you can keep it brief as well. Yeah. Um, Part of the stuff that I'm working on is concurrency and like parallelism and especially in, a, in an environment where you might not have space and time yet, you're looking at concurrency. And the question is language, I always see, so it's a comment about language, you say language and meta language. Well, language, a lot of times when we talk about language, we're talking about sequential language. So what happens if you have concurrent thought, kind of like if you're in this Zen state or, you know, oneness state, it's like a concurrent state. It's not sequential. In fact, trying to turn it into sequential language is really hard because we don't have words to do that and words are sequential. So maybe you could comment about what kind of language you're talking about, sequential language or this more like concurrent thought pattern, which is much bigger than sequential language because it talks about uh, time. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would take the largest bite I could. Um, the languages that we know in mathematics that have concurrency are geometry. Right. Think of elementary geometry and think of your experiences in it. You, everyone has had the experience of doing exercise in geometry and you're looking and looking and then it, there it is. Right. And then you can explain it. Oh, this, this, and you draw this line and this and that and so on. Um, but the thing comes in as a whole and you understood it as a whole and you were able to bring it forth. And, and we know this uh, is certainly part of, uh, of, our heritage of, of being able to think, of being able to be conscious. Um, and we don't know how to articulate it very well, of course, but, but there is the richness of geometry in mathematics and its allied topology and so on that, uh, that gives us some hints about that. Okay. I, can um, I add no. some, okay. Sorry? Can I, can I add something to this last chain of thought? Yeah, sure. Yeah, just, yeah. Just very quickly. So when we were talking about um, uh, language and going to meta language, I, I had in mind Lou's um, construction of uh, I from the reflexive equation um, x equals minus one over x. 
And if you take that to the limit, then you, know, you get the square root of minus one i um, out of an infinite process. So when you talk about a sequential um, uh, language, a computation, if you think about um, having that uh, uh, refer to itself reflexively, and then at some point in the limiting process, you get another dimension pop out, which is the, the complex plane of having this square root of minus one. At that point, you have geometry and you have concurrency and you have conscience in the sense that you can look at something uh, and see an angle between it. Yeah, well, there, what happened in the limiting process there is that at the limit, it fitted together, right? Think of the infinite nest of boxes. You have the concept of the infinite nest of boxes which has the property that one more box didn't change it. But it's your understanding that one more box didn't change it. You didn't have to go to infinity. Uh, you, you, at some point, you, 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 you accepted the fact that this, this allowed you to say that one more box didn't change it. Uh, so you don't require an actual process. You um, just require the understanding conceptually that's correct you get to a point where yeah, you never constructed the infinity of boxes that's what i'm saying right the infinity of boxes just became a symbol for you for something which didn't change under one more box but my main point was that this creates a, a new dimension so that things are no longer strictly yeah yeah there, that, that added a new dimension however right because if you had a finite number of boxes, then it would change. So you had to go to a new dimension, uh, which you called infinity, where uh, it didn't change. And, and uh, it, 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 it fit logically into your imagination in some way that you find you can deal with. Other people don't want it, right? They say, I don't believe in infinity. I don't believe in infinity because you can't construct it. But, but let me give you an example of the fitting. Um, uh, this sentence has 34 letters. That may or not be true, may be true or not, but I think it is, all right? That's an example of it fitting. It just fit, right? Um, if it's true, right? Um, this sentence has 34 letters. Uh, it, the, this sentence has X letters as a, as, a, as an operator, and it happens to fit itself perfectly at 34. And you can't get there by a limit, right? You, you don't get there by taking a limit. You, you got there by it fitting. But I wanted to posit um, a parallel thing Spends respect to formal logic where you have this hierarchical thing such as first order, second order, or Goodell's um, uh, paper on the lengths of proofs where the expressivity increases uh, at each level of the hierarchy to be more expressive when you have a language that talks about the lower order language. But eventually you can take the same conceptual process where you collapse that hierarchy and you say the language equals the meta language and we have that any, any formal logical system can be expressed in ones and zeros, but the level of the substrate, um, it's, it's all the same. So I'm suggesting that you can have a formal hierarchy um, and still imagine it collapsing. And that's what we see in laws of form, where you can go from the primary arithmetic to the primary algebra to a predicate calculus, but it's still on the same level, it's hmm. in the same substrate. Yeah, and, and it depends on what distinction you might want to make. Like if you take a stack of marks, right, a nested marks, right, <coughs> then it will collapse either even or odd, right? Marked or unmarked, right? But if it was counting that you wanted, then maybe you want to, you want to make the stack of one different from the stack of two, different from the stack of three and so on. And so you, you play a different game. You institute a rule that says that they're different. And then, and then you have them. You have them. You created them by making that distinction, like by adopting that rule. So I think um, the conclusion is that having language equal meta-language induces a subjectivity, a, a way of seeing the same um, substrate pattern from multiple perspectives or having a different interpretation on it. Lord, well, Lord, I mean, when I say, as a question of what you mean when I say equals, right? When I say language equals meta-language, I mean 
I mean, you can always understand that a comment is part of the language. And if you wish, you can make a distinction between your comments and the language. No one said you didn't have the right to make a distinction. You have the right to make a distinction and you have the right to unmake some distinctions. I, I problem with Russell. Okay, look, I, I want to say to everybody here, uh, we have some slots for presentations in September. Please do give us a presentation because, um, yeah, so, sometimes it's easy for questions to sound like presentations as well. And, and actually doing that as a proper presentation would be a nicer way of doing it in, in a way. Look, um, Lou, I, I, I don't know what to say. I, th I thought your presentation was um, quite moving in a way and your slides are exceptionally beautiful, particularly at the beginning. I've, I've never seen anything like it. And um, I just want to thank you because it's been a real privilege to, um, to be able to sit in this session and, and listen to you. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Enrico's got a question quickly. Okay, Enrico. Enrico. Oh my goodness. No, are you sure? Uh, if you want to close, okay. Well, I'm hungry. That's all. But maybe, maybe no, 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 no. I can, I can make a question, and uh, maybe we, we can leave the, the, the answer floating in the air. You know, so um, I understood that uh, zero can be both a number or a symbol, you know? and um, sometimes it is a number, sometimes it is a symbol. And um, my question is, uh, who decides when it's the right time for zero to be a number and when it's the right time for zero to be a symbol? Because put in this way, it seems that there is something, I mean, an entity higher in the hierarchy that may decide uh, zero's behavior. I mean, well, I, I think the simple answer is that uh, you decide. Uh, but, but of course, if, yeah. if, if it, uh, but suppose it was me and uh, I'm about yeah. to give a lecture to uh, the topology conference, um, uh, then uh, there are a lot of things that I would be implicitly assumed to be taking on a uh, given, right? Like, any any constructions I made would be assumed to be uh, uh, in the normal frame of of forming sets, for example. And and if I started talking to them about epistemology, uh, they would be amused and wondering why I wasn't talking about the topology problem. So so I, so of course it's my choice, but I'm just talking about a social situation. It could have been talking to your relatives. Um, what do I say in a given social situation? Which distinctions am I going to dispute? If I talk to uh, my relatives about American politics, uh, I mean my wife's relatives about American politics, perhaps, then um, I, I would speak quite differently than if I talked to my relatives about American politics. So it, it, it's always a personal <laughs> choice. Yeah, but it's usually mediated by the social situation. Yeah, yeah but there is something special about zero because uh, it's not mm. the same with the symbol of uh, infinite, you know. Um, zero is basically the only number that uh, has this kind of uh, ambiguity, you know, and uh, it's an ambiguity that depends <laughs> on uh, on the, the person that makes the, the distinction. No. Now, there are a lot um, of thoughts you can uh, have about zero. Let me give you, I'm sorry, let me, yeah. let me, let me interrupt for a second. Um, yeah. An old friend of mine, Joe Staley, he used to say, zero times zero is not equal to zero. Zero times mm -hmm. zero means zero zeros, which is nothing. So zero times zero is nothing, not zero. Okay. That's a completely I, I valid train of thought, is it not? Yeah, yeah, sure. But, no, I think. Uh, but should I tell this? Should I tell? Should I tell this to my arithmetic class if I have one? 
<laughs> yeah, no, no. It, maybe it, it was just uh, another way to phrase the, the same question about language and meta language. It was mm -hmm. just a different yeah. way. Yeah. Maybe. We, we've got plenty more days and indeed weeks uh, to talk about nothing. And, um, and I hope we do. Um, <laughs> but, but thank you again very much, uh, Lou. D Dino is going to talk tomorrow. Dino, very, very briefly, just give us a, a quick introduction to what you're going to say tomorrow. Oh, yes. Uh, I uh, shall start from uh, an historical... I am an historian, after all, an historian of philosophy. And uh, uh, from uh, um, it, uh, um, a, ta uh, a typescript uh, of uh, discussions in uh, 1960 about self-organization by some uh, of the founders of AMPA and uh, who belonged at that time to the Cambridge Language Research Unit. And starting from that, I shall uh, uh, talk uh, a little bit about the relationship between uh, Frederick Parker Rhodes uh, and his book uh, on inferential semantics. And uh, uh, the, I think what w uh, were the very likely influences he got from uh, Michael Halliday, who was a, a founding member of the Cambridge Language Research Unit as well. And at, at that time, he was in Cambridge as a lecturer of Chinese, and he got his PhD there. And okay. so, uh, and the, the, the whole thing is uh, about uh, dealing with uh, self-organization and uh, from the point of view of, uh, let us say, uh, not, not so much linguistics, but uh, philosophy of language. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, I'm really looking forward to that. And um, well, for some of us, it's dinner time, and for the rest of the rest of you, it's lunch time, I guess. But um, thank you ever so much for coming, and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Um, Lou, if you if you can send me your slides, and I'll I'll I will always send them to the Ampa chat, um, and I'll send the video of this this presentation round later on today. Okay, will do. All right, thank you ever so much. Somebody everybody. asked about the thank you. Good the mail list.ampa.onl. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.